perfect. Thank you. Let me begin by welcoming you to Duke and to this, uh, this summer session. Uh, it's a pleasure for me both to see colleagues and former students and, uh, and to meet new friends, and uh, especially when we come from such very different places, to gather, to, when we gather in a place like this for a time such as this, uh, that's profoundly satisfying. And so I look forward to hearing from you and hearing your insights, as well as sort of being able to share um, where I'm beginning. And that's really the purpose of this lecture, is to sort of set the ground, to lay the theological foundation for what's going to be coming. Now, when we speak of reconciliation, the first thing I think we have to realize is that reconciliation is not unique to Christianity. All right? However, Christian reconciliation is distinctive. It is distinctive because of the theological foundation on which it is based. Right? And that theological foundation, of course, is the reality of the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Therefore, what the purpose of this lecture is, is to um, discover what that theological foundation is, and, as it were, to unpack the logic of reconciliation based on Jesus' reconciling work. But then also, and this is different from previous years, we're going to then ask the question, what does the reconciliation between humanity and God and between human beings have to do with reconciliation with material creation. In other words, the world around us. I mean, and it's my pleasure uh, that Norbert Wilson will be following after me and begin to unpack, you know, the practical issues involving our current climate crisis, all right? Now, the place to begin, of course, is with the scripture. We've already heard it this morning in worship, but it's always good to hear scripture again, all right? So what I would ask you to do is simply listen, all right? If you will, close your eyes and see what words stand out to you that you've heard before but maybe are hearing differently or hearing God speak to you. 2 Corinthians 15, 5, verses 14 through 18. For the love of Christ controls us, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. He died for all, that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once regarded Christ from a human point of view. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, the old has passed away, and the new has come. All of this is from God, through Christ, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now what I'm going to do essentially is unpack this very pregnant passage of scripture. The first thing to be said is the thesis that I'm going to argue. And what I want to present is, and this is common in the a common thesis that um, the Center for Reconciliation has had, as well as our partner institutions and programs. And it's this: that the work of reconciliation is not primarily our work. It is not the case that we exist to bring the kingdom of God into the world, much less make the kingdom of God. Rather, 
The work of reconciliation is God's work, and it is a work he has already done in Christ, such that the new creation, in a profound sense, is a present reality, at the same time that it is an unfolding reality. But God's work, because he has made us ministers of reconciliation, does not free us to do nothing, but rather our job is to bear witness to and live in to the reality of the new creation that Christ has inaugurated. So in other words, we have to affirm both God's agency and that that is prior. But because of his agency, we are given agency to be instruments of making the cre new creation. Now, the first place in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 that Paul uses the language of new creation is here in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. The first place we need to focus is on that prepositional phrase, in Christ. When Paul uses that expression, that is code for baptism. In other words, for Paul, our baptism is about our incorporation into Christ. It's not just the case that it is a form of a ritual initiation by which we join the church. When we speak about that, we lose the mystical, and if you will, the metaphysical implication that we are becoming part of God, Christ's very body. There is a union that is happening. Right? And this is what he describes in Romans chapter 6. There, Paul is writing to Gentile converts, and the point of the letter, or one major element, is to say to these Gentile converts, who at one time had been worshipping the gods of the Roman pantheon, Hera, I mean, uh, uh, that's Greek, uh, Jupiter and Juno, Mars and Apollo, he's saying to them, look, you gave that up when you were baptized, and therefore by giving up those gods and accepting the one true God, you have to accept the ways of the one true God. All right? And therefore, he says, in baptism, we have died with Christ and are raised with Christ. I love this verse. If we are united with Christ in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. All right? Therefore, notice... I mean, okay, and here I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters in those traditions that do baptism the right way, by immersion. Right? I was sprinkled, and, and when I baptized my wife and two children, I poured a lot of water. None of this that like, drips off your finger stuff. Paul's image is that when we are baptized, we are lowered into the water, symbolically dying with Christ, and our old self is being buried. But then we are also raised out of the water, symbolic of our resurrection. And that resurrection has a double sense. It is both that we are made alive because we receive the Holy Spirit at our baptism, but also it is God's promise that in the fullness of time at his return, we will be raised as Christ is raised. And since Christ is raised bodily, we expect to be raised bodily as well. And I'll work out that implication a little bit further. All right. But for Paul, what's critical here as he goes on to speak in Romans chapter 8 is that this is, this is a new life of walking in the Spirit, or walking in newness of life. And I think Paul's language in Romans of walking in newness of life corresponds with what he's talking about as new creation in 2 Corinthians. All right? So now, the term new creation. I want to suggest that there are at least three possible 
meanings or senses that the term new creation has. The first, new creation signifies a new relationship between God and humanity. In other words, we move from a state of being estranged from God because of sin, because we have been reconciled. And the key verse here is, you know, what comes after his discussion of new creation. Having said, there is a new creation, he then qualifies it with the clause, the old has passed away, the new has come. And then he says, all of this is from God. Notice, all of this is from God. What is he doing? He is placing primary agency with God. The work of new creation is what God has done. All right? But then he goes on to explain how, that's, how God accomplishes that. Who, through Christ, reconciled us to himself. And then he repeats it as if his readers hadn't gotten it, and given the Corinthians, that's probably smart, when he says, and God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, what's this, the old that has passed away? Well, the old, the old humanity that's passed away is that humanity which was, because of sin, alienated from God, and therefore subject to death. Right. We need to define sin at this point, subject we all love to talk about, <laughs> though it's a very active part of our lives. <laughs> sin, let me give Augustine gives two definitions that are I think are helpful. The first definition is love is what he calls a disordered love. Sin is disordered love. And that is essentially his reworking of the language used in Romans 1, which speaks of loving the, or worshiping the creature rather than the creator. It is to love the things of this world more than the one who is the source of the things of this world. Right? In other words, it's idolatry. Okay? But then Augustine also explains sin as pride. Now, what he means by pride is, I mean, you and I tend to think of someone who's proud, someone who has an exaggerated sense of who they are. They're sort of puffed up in all respects. And that is true, but Augustine is going to add a nuance to it. Essentially, pride is the hubris of claiming to be God. Mm. It is the error of our first parents who presumed that they could make themselves God. They could be the source of their own happiness, their own flourishing, all on their own. I mean, I've seen this slogan recently that, you know, the sort of bumper sticker philosophy that says, you are enough. <laughs> that is profoundly proud. Mm. That is not a Christian sentiment. Mm. It is the fact that we are not enough, but absolutely dependent on the God who made us and who <clears throat> redeemed us and who gives us the spirit that we can be enough for the task. Mm. Right? But we are not sufficient, nor are we autonomous. Pride seeks to be our own Lord and Master rather than being content to be the servant of our gracious God. All right? So that's what has been rejected. But if that's the old that was put to death in baptism, what is the new that's implied? Well, if, it, if the old has been an emphasis upon self-sufficiency, the new is a recognition that we are creatures and as scripture says, what do you have that you have not received? It is that recognition of absolute dependence upon God. But it also is peace. Because it means that our will is no longer fundamentally at war with God's will. But rather the Christian life is the quest to make our will conform to God's will, or better put, to seek the grace 
by which our will can be conformed to God's will. All right? And then, of course, it means life. We tend to talk very often about death as being a perfectly natural thing. And at one level it may be, but there is an understanding of death that Christians have that's different, and that is simply, if, if God is life, to be separated from God because of sin is to be separated from the one who is life itself. And therefore, are we surprised that death is the consequence? Right? What did Jesus say? I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you are cut off from the source of life, you just wither and die. No, we, through Christ, have been regrafted onto our vine. And so his life flows through us, and we live. Right? But now the question, how does Christ's how does Christ reconcile humanity with the Father? Well, I think Paul articulates this in Romans chapter 5 when he uses what we call the second Adam typology. And it's basically a contrast between the first Adam and Jesus. Paul says, there was the first man, and death came through him to all because of his disobedience. By the sin of the first man came death to all. But by the obedience of the second Adam, by the obedience of Christ, life came to all people as well. Right? Therefore, what Paul is saying is that Christ is paradigmatic of a new humanity. Even as Adam was the father of the fallen race of humanity, Christ becomes the father of a new race, a redeemed race. Right? Therefore, Christ, to be, um, uh, to experience this new relationship, is based on Christ's act of perfect obedience. Christ is our brother who finally did what we should have done all along. Love God with his whole being. And this, I think, gets picked up then in 2 Corinthians, when in verse 14 and 15, he says, Paul says, We are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. It's the same point of Christ as our representative who creates the condition by which we live no longer with a proud self-orientation, but we are freed to live for others. But that brings the next question. So what is the relationship between reconciliation and new creation? Well, notice Paul's logic. If sin is alienation from God, who is life, and alienation therefore results in death, if we are reconciled to the one who is life, we are given freedom from death. Therefore, the point is that Christ's death, his faithfulness as our representative, means that a new reality, a new relationship has been inaugurated, that is Christ's, through his death and resurrection. That's the first form of new creation. The second form is what I would call horizontal uh, reconciliation. And that horizontal meaning the relationship between creatures, between people, is the direct product of the vertical reconciliation between us and God. All right? He says in, uh, in verse 16, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once regarded Christ from a human point of view, we regard him thus no longer. All right. 
Notice, he's already saying that our view of others is changing as a result of our new view of who Christ is and who we are in Christ. Right? And this is something else I wanted to say. If that's beautiful homily today was spot on. You see, Paul is working with what I would call a baptismal ontology. We talk a lot today about our identity, who we are. And for Christians, whatever identity we have, you know, I mean, I am a white male southerner, right? But my primary identity is the new identity I receive in baptism. It is the new me. And to be the new me in the body of Christ means to be a part of the new we. All right. right. But that's who I am by virtue of my baptism. It's who we are. The only question is then how do we live into that reality? But because God has in Christ has created that reconciliation here, it also forms the basis of reconciliation here. Why? Because if new creation entails a rightly ordered love, the love of the creator above the creation, to love God means you got to love what God loves. And therefore, God's love becomes condition for our love of other things. All right. In other words, because God loves our brothers and sisters, we have to love our brothers and sisters as well, right? We throw around the term unconditional love so much I'm sick of it, right? right? The point is, we don't love anyone unconditionally except God. But what does unconditional love it gestures to? It's the idea that we sort of love people where they are and the only reason we can do that is because we know what God has already done in the new creation. Because we know God loves them, we ourselves are obliged to love even when they are hard to love. Therefore, notice Jesus makes this pretty plain in one of the most poignant passages of Scripture that we say without thinking the words of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What is Jesus saying? We will be forgiven in accordance with our forgiveness of others. We will be shown mercy even as, you know, to the extent that we are willing to show mercy to others. Thank God his mercy is far greater than ours. Right. Right? Right. Therefore, we don't have an option. We must be, we must love and care for people on the horizontal plane. Right. And the classic instance of this where Jesus talks about it is in the parable of the two debtors. You'll remember Jesus says that <clears throat> there's 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 a two servants. And the one servant owes, uh, you know, a minuscule amount and the, to his debtor, I mean, to his, the person from whom he borrowed it. And that servant is angry with him and says, look, you pay me what you owe. The man says, have, have patience with me. Have patience and I'll pay you back. And the man says, no. You know, it has him thrown in jail. But then the master hears, and Jesus' point Look sometime at the difference in the money that's being discussed in that passage. The, the one who made the, you know, a, a small loan to his fellow servant is hugely in debt. I think the figure I once calculated is that it would take, oh, about a thousand lifetimes to pay it off. And he goes to the master, and the master says, I want that money. And he says, I can't. Have mercy. Same words used by the slave he had thrown in prison. The master says, Ah, I will throw you in prison and you will stay there until you pay the debt. Mercy is given to us 
if we show mercy to others. If we expect to be beneficiaries of God's mercy, we better show it to our brothers and sisters. Now, the third sense of reconciliation, or the third sense of new creation, and this is resurrection and the redemption of creation. Resurrection and the redemption of creation. I call this the eschatological consequence of Christ's sacrifice. For in Christ, we participate in his very being. We are partakers of the resurrection. In other words, if we take seriously the idea that we are united to Christ, then we participate in the very life-giving power of his divinity. Now, some people are shy away from this. You know, they, they, they sort of like to say, look, we simply have a relational change. When the woman with the issue of blood went and she touched him, <coughs> Jesus said, who touched me? For he felt power go out of him. Right? In other words, that is what participation means. And so we, by virtue of our union with Christ in baptism, begin to receive that power in the form of the Holy Spirit. Right? It is divinity intersecting humanity and transforming our humanity. And that then carries over in not just to this life, but into the life to come. So that, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15, we, though buried in corruption, will be raised incorruptible. We, who are buried mortal, will be raised immortal. I mean, those are the very features of God's nature in which we participate. But here's the key. Here's the key. The resurrection is not just a spiritual resurrection. It isn't what Boltmann described as sort of an existential understanding of yourself. It is a bodily resurrection. As Paul said, if the dead are not raised, we are most to be pitied. Therefore, notice, the salvation that comes to us through Christ is not just of our souls, but of our bodies as well. Therefore, resurrection changes the way we think, not just about our own salvation, but our relationship with the rest of the world, with other creatures. For you see, if we're raised bodily, then our material bodies have to have a place that is bodily to inhabit. Therefore, our bodies and creation itself is raised. Now, I suppose the best way to illustrate this is to make a contrast between Christianity and two philosophical schools that were prevalent during the period of early Christianity. The first are the Epicureans. The Epicureans were materialists who believed that everything is simply matter. Therefore, they didn't believe that there were souls that were able to survive the body and death. Therefore, for the Epicureans, when you died, when your body stopped working and you were put in the ground, then it's just your atoms becoming reassembled into, uh, assimilated into the rest of the dirt. You become the food for worms, and that's it. Therefore, what was the Epicurean view of happiness? Well, if everything's matter, then you want to maximize your experience of the good of the material world. In other words, the highest good is pleasure. Yeah. And it's a physical pleasure, and it's a pleasure you have now. You're not banking anything for a future life. It's all about now. So what was the motto? Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> For tomorrow you die. Exactly. The Latin phrase was carpe diem. Yeah. Seize the day. Right? 
as I'm walking here, I pass by a in a parking lot. There's a Jeep that has a bumper sticker that I've had to look at all year, and it said, <laughs> "One life, period. Live well, period." That's Epicureanism. There's nothing beyond this. Therefore, this life is of ultimate significance. This life is the only significance, so you better live well and enjoy yourself because you're not going to get a return ticket. All right. Notice what Christianity does. The resurrection means that we have life beyond this life so that the present is not the be-all and end-all. With me? Now, the second group are Platonists. Now, Platonism was a lot closer to Christianity for several reasons. Platonists believed that there was a God who created the world, and they believed that there was not only matter, but that there was an, uh, uh, an incorporeal substance, immaterial substance. Ideas were real even as God is real. Right? Ideas are in the mind of God. And, therefore, they believe that we have souls that survive the body in death. Right? So, for them, there is both this life and then the life to come. But where the difference is, Plato taught that death is an act of liberation. Mm -hmm. Salvation comes at death because we are freed from our bodies. For to Plato, our bodies were a thing of were a point of imprisonment, right? And, you know, give the devil his due, right? He said, number one, our bodies are the source of error. I'm driving down the road. It's August in North Carolina. Now I'm on a flat stretch, and I look ahead. What do I see in the road? It looks like an oasis. And I get there, and no water. My senses told me there was water up ahead. There wasn't. My senses deceived me. Therefore, he says, the body is not the source of knowledge, but deception. Right? But he also says, look, the body puts burdens on us. You know, instead of just, you know, instead of just doing what I should be doing, then we sort of like thinking about the good and growing in my knowledge of God and the world. I've got to work in order to clothe this body, and to house this body, and to feed this body. Not only my body, but the body of my wife and children. They're getting more expensive every day. They're going to college. <laughs> and what's more, the body is the source of pain. I love my students, and I love the fact that they are young, so many of them right out of college. But when I hear them waxing eloquent about how great the body is, I want to say, have you spent much time in a cancer ward? Mm -hmm. Paul's right. The body right now can feel like a prison. Right? He speaks of this body of death. Right? This body is a problem. The resurrection is going to bring healing, but right now, the body is the source of a great deal of suffering. That's Plato's argument. But therefore, for him, the solution is to be liberated from the body. For Plato, re resurrection would simply be reincarceration, mm. to be stuck back in that old body back in the ignorance, back in the passions, back in the suffering. But resurrection means, because it is new creation, it is a new body. It is this body, which God made in the beginning and pronounced good, now healed, purified, liberated from the suffering that we currently experience. To be honest, if you have the choice between living in the current state eternally without death or with death, which would you choose? I don't want to live in this state forever. 
Not North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> well, this condition. <laughs> but we can also name many states. <laughs> Paul. But Paul senses that the resurrected body is God's healing of creation, God's perfecting of creation, so that creation can be what God intended it to be from the very beginning untainted by sin. All right? And you see Paul saying this as much in Second Corinth in um, Romans, when he talks not just about the redemption of our souls, but the redemption of creation itself. Notice what he says. I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and attain the glorious liberty of the sons of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Notice, Paul, by, using, by speaking of creation, that is going to be redeemed, is not just talking about redemption for human beings. That creation is much, much larger. Now, I will bracket the pastoral question of whether or not animal, cats and dogs, are resurrected. <laughs> John Wesley, in his later days, said that he believed that animals would be resurrected too. Why would you believe that? It doesn't say that in Scripture. Wesley's answer was, God is just, and animals have suffered enough at the hands of human beings. And here, as an Englishman in the 18th century, he's thinking of bull baiting, bear baiting, dog baiting, right? I mean, cock fighting, animals subjected to misery just for human gratification. And his point is, if God is just, then those who are the victims of injustice must receive you know, new life and blessing. Right. Now, so we have new creation thought of three ways. First, as this vertical reconciliation between us and God. Second, the horizontal reconciliation, in which we have a new relationship with one another, in which we love one another because God loves them as God loves us. And third, a new creation that is hoped for at the resurrection when all of creation will be healed and, in a sense, restored. Right? But right now, creation is groaning. It's groaning when we see the fires that are sweeping through and burning houses in California. It's groaning when we see mega storms and flooding and earthquakes. And some of those are caused by us. But some of those are also caused because of our neglect. Now, let's, let's give the devil his due for a moment. Some people will make the argument, look, yeah, there are a lot of bad things happening in nature right now. But if we believe in resurrection, if we believe that in the fullness of time when Christ comes back, he will heal creation, then if he's the one healing creation at the end of the day, we don't have an obligation to care for it. We can simply use creation for our own satisfaction now, knowing that God will put the pieces back together. If you will, 
we've made a wreck of our own bodies, and God will heal them. So God will heal, you know, the body of the universe. Why is that wrong? Let me give you three reasons. Number one, we have a duty to creation. And that duty comes out of our very creation. In Genesis 126 and 127, God is planning the creation of human beings. And God says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. You know this passage, and it's one of the most misused passages in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And let them have dominion over creation. All right? Now, one of the ways Augustine speaks of, dis of sin is libido dominandi, meaning the lust for domination. Mm -hmm. right? And he said the lust for domination and Rome's empire embodied that was the sense of our greatness is our ability to dominate others, to use others for our purpose. All right? And so we have done with nature. But why does Genesis link made in God's image with granting dominion? Why does God make us in God's image except that we may know God in order to steward creation according to God's will. In other words, if we are going to be caretakers of the garden, then we better know what the intent of the owner, the planner of the garden is. God made us in his image so that we could care for creation, not as we see fit, for our own self-indulgence and self-gratification, but that we might care for creation as God would want it. In other words, even as God desires our flourishing, God also desires the flourishing of creation, and it's our obligation to seek the flourishing of all things not just ourselves. Second, we live as resident aliens. Augustine said that we are pilgrims in exile on a journey to our homeland. I mean, it's the clear sense, very anti-Epicurean sense. It's the sense that, look, this is not our home in an ultimate sense, but our home is where God is and where we will be with God eschatologically. But Augustine also said that pilgrimage is not a spatial movement from here to heaven. It is a movement of the heart from here to God. And therefore, when Augustine is talking about our life, he's saying, first, we orient ourselves toward God. But in that orientation, it spills over into the way we live in the present. Right? And notice, he's simply echoing something that Jeremiah said. Jeremiah speaking to the exiles, who were so confident that they were going to be going back to Palestine very soon, and Jeremiah disabuses them of that idea. And here's what he says. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what they're to do. Build houses and live in them. Mm -hmm. Plant gardens mm -hmm. and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For its welfare, you will find your welfare. Right. Notice what he's saying there. He's saying, 
Babylon is not your home. You are living in exile there. But while you are in exile, you must care for that place. You care for the city of your exile. You live there and you seek its welfare because your welfare depends on the welfare of Babylon. So too, we must care for this world because it is not only our duty, but because our very livelihood, our flourishing in this time, depends on how we care for it. And third, justice. And the definition of justice I'm going to be used is taken from Plato. Plato says justice is not simply giving to each his or her due. Justice is giving to each what is required for their flourishing. And therefore, if we seek the flourishing of one another and the flourishing of creation, I mean, if we are bound by justice, and mind you, in Greek, the word for justice is dikaiosune, the same word translated righteousness. If we seek the righteousness of God, we seek the justice of God, and therefore we seek the flourishing of all God's creatures. Therefore, this vertical relationship defines all other relationships, and not just with our bipedal brothers and sisters, but with all creation as well. And we will be judged by how we use or don't use it. All right, so let me stop there. <laughs>